I think, I think the question is a very big one. You know, we're just coming, we've had so many crunch moments in Brexit, it, it's quite hard to imagine that the vote was four and a half years ago and, and somehow we, we, we are outside the European Union. That happened just before everybody started to become really alert to, to COVID. That happened on the 31st of January this year. Um, but we don't leave the, the EU single market till 1st of January next year and and somehow we, we've been told again and again well this is a crunch moment or boris johnson has walked away again um but it really is a, a crunch few days coming up um we, we are literally almost out of time and it, it's quite extraordinary in that um to to hear decent media sources suggesting boris johnson hasn't quite made his mind up if he wants the very basic deal he's negotiating or would prefer in the midst of this covid crisis the additional chaos of um, a no deal Brexit. Um, and, and Rishi Sunak keeps talking about, you know, with, with his budget today and, and talking about um, how to tackle, rightly talking about how to tackle the economic crisis out of COVID without actually talking about the parallel and longer term impact of, of Brexit. And a, and a number of economists have, have looked at this in detail indeed and, and suggested that the UK economy in the end will be harder hit over the next decade by Brexit than even by this extraordinary COVID crisis. Mm. I, I think trying to bring out a few um, positive tales in this. Um, at the start of the crisis, obviously for, for Europe, it especially took off in Italy and the EU stumbled quite a bit then, not only was, was and is health mostly devolved to individual member states, but, but the coordination, emergency coordination mechanisms that were there didn't work very well to begin with. But then if you fast forward to today and where, where we are seven, eight months later, we, we've seen the EU do joint procurement on PPE, putting huge uh, joint procurement for COVID vaccines. We've obviously seen the UK government sadly choose to just go down its own path and not participate in that. And we've seen an extraordinary effort um, in the summer uh, for the EU to, to create a very, very big recovery fund and even give the European Commission for the first time ever um, the right to go out and raise funds on, on the financial markets and to give a big part of that money to countries, member states who need it as grants, not as loans. So I think there's a lot of hopeful stuff there you know the some people said or, or some brexiters hoped the eu would be done down by brexit but actually in the end and four and a half years later we we see that in a funny way the eu unified around uh, the brexit challenge to to defend what the eu is for and also to move forward and and when you look at that recovery fund i was just talking about the european recovery fund um quite rightly, there's an effort to make a big chunk of that focus on green issues and to link it back to the big aims of the European Green Deal. Where does Scotland fit into all that? And can we be hopeful about Scotland? You know, at, at one level, it's quite difficult, obviously. Scotland didn't vote to leave the European Union. It's had almost no say. Um, it's tried to have a say in the talks between the UK and EU, but, but essentially been ignored. Um, but I think because it voted Remain, that's been very much noticed in Brussels and in other European capitals. Um, on the whole, EU member states are not going to get involved if there's another Scottish independence referendum, but there's a, a lot more understanding of that as a possibility, uh, understanding of how and why that might happen. Um, and I, and I, think, I think in a way, I mean, for a lot of people, you know, part of the reason the support for independence has gone up uh, since the summer, you know, to, to a clear majority for now in the polls for independence is, is partly because of COVID. There are also people who voted Remain, uh, who used to say no to independence, who are now saying yes to independence. Um, so I, I think it's made people think again about, well, well is, is there a choice between two unions here, between the UK and the and the EU. Um, but I also think, just to end on this maybe, I, I think there's there's wider things we all need to think about in, in thinking about Europe. Brexit may have happened, but we're still a European island. We don't usually talk about Britain or Scotland and England or the UK in that way, but we're we're a European island and a bit with Northern Ireland. Um, 
and I've, I've been talking to a lot of EU commentators and officials recently for, for another paper I've just published on how the EU sees the UK at the moment. Uh, and although there's a lot of very negative views there, not surprisingly, about the UK, there's a repeated interest in building a better, more positive, closer relationship and the hope that perhaps if there's a thin trade deal, that can happen. I think, I think the people in the EU are, are much more alert, at least than UK politicians, to the fact that we're near geographic neighbours. We're not moving this island anywhere. And even if Scotland does become independent and perhaps independent in the EU at some point, it's still going to be geographically where it is. And both England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland all have to think how they strengthen and if they want to strengthen their, their multiple European links.